Okay. Well, that's loud. <laughs> um, yeah, feels like I was up here not too long ago, and here we are again. Thank you for coming to the, well, well I guess last session, second to last thing that's going to happen today. So, uh, as a reminder, if you have any of these uh, tickets in your pockets and want to win one of these things, put your name on the back, bring them up here, and once we finish with this, Stephen's going to come and wrap things up for the event and raffle out the, uh, the VR headset, the GoPro, and the iPad Air. There are a bunch of people still like just getting their coffee, so there'll probably be some folks coming in, but since we have a tight schedule, we're going to blast right through it. So yeah, happy to see so many of you made it all the way to the end of a conference. I know it's been <laughs> a very densely packed two days of information, so hopefully after this you can go and let your brains relax for a little bit. Now, ChatGPT can be really like mind-blowing, literally mind-blowing. So last week, my dog Nova had to go in for a CT scan at the vet, and the radiologist, for whatever reason, decided to just take a picture of the report with his phone, send it to me, like an A4 with like densely packed text, like everything good, bad, in between was explained in the same intricate medical jargon detail. I had no idea what was going on. Good, bad, maybe, who knows? So I took the picture, I uploaded it to ChatGPT, said like, you are a radiologist who's exceptionally good at communicating things to patients, and can you please explain what's relevant in this report? And I got very clearly like different areas, a couple of bullet points, and like a summary, like yes, there's nothing to worry about, everything is fine, like your dog is just old and has some like wear and tear here and there. So very good news, uh, that would not have been possible a year ago, so it's like, I can see that there's just a huge possibility for us to use AI tools from, for some like amazing things. Like, sure, there are a couple of like worries, like what's gonna happen, but as a curious person, what I've done for the past year is just try to understand how do they work? Like, uh, for me at least as a, as a developer, like understanding how something actually works makes it a lot less scary and weird and diffuse. So I wanted to understand like, what are LLMs and AI models good at? Why are they so stupid sometimes? How can I use AI tools in my own work to kind of focus more on the interesting stuff and automate away all the boring stuff in my life? And what we're gonna look at today is like, how can we integrate these tools into the apps that we build so that our users can do more of the fun stuff, the interesting stuff, meaningful stuff, and less of the boring stuff. Now, there's a one kind of very big problem when we're looking at AI and business apps in the same context, and that's that LLMs, large language models like GPT, are very generic. They're trained on generic information, whereas most of our businesses are very specific. We do very specific things. That's why people pay us to do those things. So uh, we can't just ask a very generic thing to do very specific things to it uh, for us. So. What I want to do today is build an AI-powered expert system. So the context we're working within is a car rental agency, and we're going to create a customer support uh, bot that is able to both reference and talk about our policy document so it knows what we can and cannot do. It also has access to some tools within our system, so it can pull up reservations based on a name and booking number. It can cancel them if our policy uh, allows for that or not. So it's not meant to be like, oh, this is a production ready system. The idea is to show you kind of what are the building blocks that are out there and how could you think about taking a generic tool like an LLM and turn it into something that drives a business application. So this is gonna be very much like AI for engineers. So this is zero data science, zero math. This is like <laughs> simplifying everything to its max. So. We're looking at like how do we put AI in a black box and just look at what's the API that we can call and get the stuff that we want. Like we don't care what's happening on the other side, how the sausage is made as long as it's delicious, right? That's how we engineers work <laughs> most of the time. Um, so we're going to use two tools for this. We're going to use Langchain, which is one of the original like AI tools that were developed a long time ago, probably like April of this year. 
<laughs> and I remember the first time I built an AI powered thing, I spent like literally thousands of lines of code just counting tokens and trying to make things happen. And then obviously now we start having tools like Langchain, Spring is coming out with Spring AI, Microsoft has Semantic Kernel, like the actual building blocks you need to stay on a relevant level of abstraction when you're building with this. So you don't have to be like, like six months ago, we were basically writing assembler code and like mapping direct memory access, whereas now we have actual high-level APIs to work on business problems. The other tool is Hilla. We already covered how Hilla works, so we're actually not gonna look too much at the UI code, more at how the actual Java code looks for building that. So, on a very like high level, since we are engineers and we are just looking at the black box from the outside, an LLM is super simple. You ask it something, Magic happens and you get an output that's either good or bad. Now, LLMs know two things. The first thing they know is everything that they've been trained on. This is, depending on the model, more or less the entire internet up until some certain point in time. And the other thing it knows is what you tell it. So anytime you interact with it, you give it a context. Um, yeah, so. The way you can then teach an LLM different things is one, you do it very difficult for yourself and you train your own model from scratch. This is very time and money consuming. So this is not what we're gonna do as lazy engineers in this talk, definitely not. You could take an existing model and teach it new things, fine tune it. That's pretty doable. It's not terribly expensive and it can really kind of improve the performance of a model. But the absolutely easiest way for us to go about this is let's just figure out what's the most relevant piece of information that the LLM needs to know to answer this particular question that we have right now. To understand that, we need to have a basic understanding of what an LLM context is. So it's essentially the working memory for the LLM. It's typically today anywhere from like 4,000 to 6, to uh, 16,000 tokens tokens being kind of a chunk of text that the LLM breaks down. So it could be anywhere from a character to an entire word. Typically it's about 25% more than the word count. So if you have a 4,000 K win or 4,000 token window, that's like say 3,000 uh, words roughly, more give or take. So you have a limited amount of memory available for you to work with. Into that you need to fit a couple of things. You need to have a system prompt, so you need to tell the LLM who it is. I told my uh, chat GPT to be a radiologist that knows how to answer things in a clear manner that human beings can understand. So likewise, we need to tell our LLM how it should behave. We need to have the history because the LLM itself does not retain any history or memory of anything. So anytime we chat with chat GPT or with our agent, anytime there's a new message, we actually send all the messages <coughs> because it doesn't know what we talked about before unless we tell it. We also obviously need the actual question or prompt that we have. And then because we're dealing with specific information, we need to include all the relevant information. Not only that, we need to make sure that there's space left in that context to actually fill out the answer that we want. So we can't use all of it. So because we have a very limited amount of kind of space to work with, and because we're getting charged by how many tokens we use, we don't wanna take all of our documentation and just try to cram it in there, even if it could fit, because that's unnecessarily expensive for us to do. So we need to figure out how do we find the most relevant, pertinent piece of information for a given prompt. So let's take an example out of what we're gonna build here. So. In our case, the piece of relevant information is going to be a terms of service document. What we're gonna do is we're gonna split it into sections. And for each section, we're gonna take a look at what is the semantic meaning of this section and turn it into a vector. That's a little weird, but that's something that we can do. Now, the way I like to explain this to people is if you've ever used a color picker, you know that for essentially any color, in the spectrum, you can move this picker around and it's gonna say like for this color, the RGB value is 235, 82, 52. So it essentially takes a color and maps it to a three dimensional vector. What we're doing with uh, these vector embeddings is we're taking 
a piece of text and we're mapping it to a 1500 dimensional vector. It's a little bit of magic and we as engineers will not go into that black box and see what's happening in there, but trust me, it can be done. What's important for us to understand though is that we need to be mindful of how we split up this text because if we, again, go back to the uh, color picker example, if we asked the color picker, what's the uh, color of this entire painting? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, like what would that be? But if we ask what's the color of that leaf on the tree, that's gonna be a meaningful thing that it can answer. So we wanna be sure to kind of split it up into meaningful sections. I stuck, stuck to three uh, dimensions here because it was really hard to fit 1500 dimensions in the examples here, but the idea is the same. Once we have these, we're gonna plop them into a vector database. So both the vector and the piece of text go into a specific vector database that knows how to deal with vectors, which means that when a user comes along, they have a question, how, I wanna cancel my reservation. We're gonna use the same algorithm to get a vector of that. And then we're gonna go to the vector database and say like, hey, give me the most similar pieces of text, like the things that are most similar in meaning to this. So out of our terms of service, uh, the most uh, relevant piece of documentation there is our cancellation policy because that has to do with canceling and our question has to do with canceling. So they're semantically very similar things. So it's gonna be able to return that to us. In vector math terms, that's gonna be a dot product. So are they, how, how similar is the direction of these two vectors? Sometimes it's a cosine product, but again, we don't really care. There's an API we can call and it's gonna figure out how that works. Up until then, like our AI is already smarter. It can answer all kinds of questions about our policy or documentation or anything else, but it's still limited in that I can't ask it like, hey, can you pull up my reservation and do something with that because it doesn't have access to any of that. So we're also gonna look at how do we expose specific tools to the LLM. We don't wanna expose all of our backend. That doesn't seem like a good idea, but we can certainly expose certain kind of methods that we allow it to call. So we're gonna take a look at how we do that. All right, so with that, enough theory, let's get coding and see how far we get. So <laughs> this is very dependent on our uh, internet working well here. So I've already built the UI. We had a whole talk about how Hilla works and how we build UIs with it, so we're not gonna spend time there. I have essentially put a grid here on the side that is a live view of our database and then we have a message list and a message input here. And if I type something, it's gonna say something. Right now it says, I'm sorry, my brain is not yet hooked up because that's where we're at. <coughs> in my project, I have already added in the POM file all the necessary dependencies. So there will, there is a Langchain, Langchain OpenAI and a embeddings all, uh, essentially a model for us to turn texts into vectors. So those are the ones that we've added here. I'm gonna share the GitHub repo, so just focus on understanding the concepts and you can spend as much or as little time as you want on the actual code later on. So I'm gonna do most of this within the actual application class here because we're gonna create a whole lot of small bean definitions kind of piece by piece putting this together. So we're gonna start at the core of it all. So we're gonna define a model that we wanna work with. So we're gonna do a new Bean, and that's gonna be a streaming chat language model. And let me turn off this because it's gonna be really annoying very quickly. Okay, so we're gonna define a new streaming chat language model. Streaming means that we want to get the response as it's getting generated instead of waiting for a minute for it to complete all of it because that's not great UX. So we're gonna return a OpenAI streaming chat model, and we're gonna use a builder. Langchain4j likes builder pattern. You're, you're gonna see this, so they're, they really like, like this. So we're gonna use a builder pattern here, and we're gonna need to pass it two things. So first is which model we wanna use. Model name, GPT-4. So that's the kind of more, most advanced model that they have. Then we need 
an API key. So I already have that in my environment as a variable. So I'm gonna do a value here, and then we're just gonna inject that from our uh, environment. So that's gonna be open, open API.API.key. And then we're gonna put that into a string called API key, like that. And finally, we're gonna use it here in our builder, like that. All right, good deal. So now we have defined how the actual model interface is gonna work. The second thing we need to do is define a tokenizer. So we talked about tokens being this representation of chunks of text, and that's depending on which model we have. So we wanna create a bean again, let's say tokenizer, and this can be just a method that returns a new tokenizer, and we're gonna return return a new open AI tokenizer. And this, again, since it's dependent on the model, will need the same model name here. We could probably refactor that out, but you get the point. All right, so then what we need next is define the API that we wanna have when we're connecting, talking to this LLM. The way this works in Langchain is that we can define an interface and then they have a builder that takes in that interface and provides a implementation. So it's sort of similar to how you would have like Spring Data give you an implementation of a, like a repository interface. This is gonna do, do the same. So I'm gonna create a new uh, interface. Let's go in here. We're gonna create a new Java class interface. And we're gonna call it customer, customer service agent. And here we're gonna define one method. It's gonna return a token stream because we are using this streaming model. The method name is going to be chat. It's gonna take in two things, a string for a chat ID and a string for the user message. So I'm gonna give every single chat a separate ID that allows me to keep track of the histories of your chat and my chat separately so they don't get all mixed up in our backend. So once we have this, we're gonna help uh, Langchain understand this. So we're gonna say that this is the memory ID and this is gonna be the user message. I think it should actually figure that out without us doing that, but uh, in our case, we're gonna be very explicit about it. The next thing I'm gonna configure here is the system message. So again, remember, this is like us telling the LLM how it should behave. So we're gonna do system message. Then since we're using modern Java, we can do three quotes for a multi-line string. And then this is my only piece of pre-baked code because I didn't feel like typing all that much. So I'm gonna put it in here and we're gonna go through what we're doing here. So I'm telling it that it's a customer support agent for a car rental company called Miles of Smiles. It should be friendly, helpful, and joyous. And before providing any information, it needs to get the following information. So the booking number, first name, last name, and before changing any bookings, it should ensure that it's permitted by the terms. So we're kind of explaining it, uh, explaining things to it like it would be a fairly junior person that doesn't know how to do things. But the final thing I'm injecting here is the current date because again, the LLM doesn't have a state, it doesn't really know anything. So unless we tell it what date it is today, it's gonna have a hard time to know if our reservation is in the future, in the past, or, or anything else. Okay, so we have the interface, and the final thing that we're gonna do in the first step here is define a bean that returns a new instance of this customer service agent. Okay, so here we are going to inject these two things that we already defined. So we'll have the streaming chat language model, and then we're gonna have the tokenizer like this. And then we're gonna return what we get from calling AI services dot builder. And then we're gonna pass in our customer service agent class here. And we're gonna build that just so we get rid of the compilation error here. Okay, so a couple of things we wanna define here. First is the language model that this agent should use. So that's gonna be our streaming chat language model that we defined up here. It's gonna have a 
chat memory provider. So for each chat ID, we're gonna provide a different memory. We're gonna use a token window chat memory. And again, it's gonna be a builder. We're gonna see this pattern happen here a lot. So what we wanna do is uh, say that for each unique chat ID, we're gonna have a maximum of, I don't know, 500 tokens using our tokenizer. This means that as we keep chatting more and more and more and using up more of our memory, we couldn't, like if we just let it grow and grow and grow, it would essentially mean that we don't have space to have our answer. So as we chat longer, older messages will just start vanishing. And you've probably noticed this with ChatGPT if you've ever had a long enough discussion, it completely forgets what you were talking about in the beginning. And that's exactly what's happening here. Okay, so we have our agent here. And what we're gonna do then is go into our Hilla service here. So right now, uh, like you remember, it says, my, I'm sorry, my brain is not yet hooked up. And that's just a static string here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna inject our chat, uh, our customer support agent here, and then we're gonna have that respond instead. So we're gonna have a private customer support agent, agent like that. Gonna create a constructor parameter for that to inject it, and then we're gonna replace this with that. Now, the token stream that we're returning in this agent is something that's Langchain specific, so that's not something that Hilla or Spring understands. So we're gonna convert it into a flux, which is a more standard data type here. For that, we're gonna create a sync, which is a programmatic way to create a flux. So we're gonna create a sync, uh, sinks.many of type string. So each kind of chunk that we're getting from there will be a, a string, uh, sync. And this were, will be created by sinks.many.unicast. So we're just streaming this to one person at a time on back pressure buffer. So if it, for whatever reason, doesn't keep up, don't drop just random words in the middle of a sentence. That would be less than ideal for what we're trying to achieve here. And then we're gonna return the sync as a flux. So what remains for us to do then is take the token stream and map it to this uh, uh, flux. So we're gonna call our agent. We're gonna use the chat method and pass in the chat ID and Apparently I called it question instead of user message, but the same thing. We're gonna say on next, sync, uh, try emit next, on complete. We're gonna say sync dot try emit complete. And then we're gonna say on error, sync, try emit error. So I'm not really doing a good job of like capturing errors here. You can probably figure out how this could go horribly wrong, but we're optimistic here, everything's gonna go well. Why wouldn't it? And then we finally call start, so that's gonna be actually what triggers it. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna forget to call start and then it's not gonna work and you're gonna pull your hair if you have any left. Uh, and yeah, that's not great. Okay, so I'm gonna build this application and if things went well, we should be able to chat with it. So let's see what happens here. Okay, and I'm gonna use the dictation because it's a whole lot easier here. So let's go in here. Hey, can you explain the cancellation policy to me? So let's see what it thinks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can see it's now coming from a model somewhere. Okay, so it seems seven days before pickup is full, three to six. I mean, this all seems very reasonable the problem is that it has no actual factual basis. It's just fully made up. It doesn't have anything to do with our <laughs> particular policy. <laughs> so this is what we call hallucination. It's like, it's gonna be equally convincing at telling you bad things and good things. So our policy, let's, let's go in and see what the actual thing is. It's terms of service. Last day, cancellation seven days prior, within seven days leading up to the start, it's not permitted. So that's clearly not permitted. So not great. And again, like that's what we could expect from a general purpose thing. Of course, it would be very much more helpful if it said like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, but that's not how it's gonna work now, is it? <laughs> okay, so back here we go. So now we have a model 
that's a generic model. So now we need to teach it things. This is, again, taking that document, splitting it into sections, doing vectors, putting them in a vector base. So that's what we're going to do here. So again, many small beans. By the end of this, we'll have enough beans to grind to a whole cup of coffee. So we'll have an embedding model. The model is what takes a piece of text, turns it into a vector. So the embedding model, we're going to return a new uh, all many, all them. So there are many models you could use for this. This is one that I could use locally within this computer, which makes the project really easy to check out. There are others you could use, like OpenAI has a really good model that's much better at detecting like nuances than this is, but for the example, this works well. The nice thing is that since these are interfaces, you can swap out each one of these. So you can start with this and you could move up to something more uh, better later. Okay, so the next thing we need is the embedding store. So this is the vector database where we store our embeddings and the embeddings are will be of type text, text segment. So embedding store, do, 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 and this will be a new in memory in memory embedding store. There we go. We probably need to return that for that to work. Yep. Okay, good deal. Um, so now we have the building blocks. Then we're going to define a retriever, which is a tool that uh, this builder knows how to use. So that's going to help it actually use these things that we have. So we're going to have, a again, a bean. We're going to start seeing pattern in what we're doing here. Retriever of type text seg segment retriever. And this will take in a couple of things. So we'll take in our embedding model. And it's going to take in our embedding store. And God, see, there we go. Of text segment, embedding store. And then we are going to return uh, building store retriever from here they didn't go for a builder pattern, go figure. Um, so this takes in a couple of things. It takes in the store, the model, how many results we want at most, and what should be the minimum score. So we could say like, give us the five best ones, but if we don't have any kind of bottom limit to how good those can be, like it, if we have like five things in there and we ask for five, we'll get literally everything. So we're gonna pass in the store, we're gonna pass in the model, we're gonna say that in our case, I happen to know that we only want one thing out of our very limited document and 0 0.6 is the minimum score. These are things you want to play around with in any actual application for it to work. Once we have that, we can go in here and say that we inject the retriever and we pass it in here as a retriever. Now, of course, this is not going to be super helpful yet because we don't have anything in here. So for that, I'm going to inline this into a command line runner. Typically, the ingestion of content would not happen in the actual application that you're consuming it from. It would be on a build server somewhere that whenever your documentation changes, it goes and redoes vectors for that particular piece of documentation. But for this, let's create a command line runner. Uh, docs to embeddings and this command line runner needs to return return args like this and we're going to implement that. For this to work we need to have a couple of things so we need to have our embedding model again. We need to have the embedding store where we put all those things. Embedding store like text segment, embedding store like that. Then we need the tokenizer, so we know how to count tokens. And then finally, we need a resource loader so we can load stuff from, from our class path. All right, so uh, resource, so I'm gonna pull this terms of service out from my class path. So we're gonna say loader dot get resource class path terms of service.txt. Then we're going to turn that into a Langchain document by using load document. No, it's not what I wanted to do. Yep. 
So we're going to take the resource file and turn that into a path, and that's going to get turned into a type of document from LangChain. Then we need a splitter. So again, remember we want to split that document into smaller sections so it actually makes sense. Document splitters dot recursive. And this takes in a couple of things. So how many tokens should each one of these be? So let's say 100 tokens, zero overlap between them, and use our tokenizer. So once we have that, we can create a ingester, which is the thing that's responsible for actually processing these. Uh, embedding store ingester dot builder dot build. And again, we're going to configure a bunch of things in here. So we are going to set the store to our store like that. We're going to set the model to the model. We're going to set the splitter to the splitter. And I think that's it. Yep. All right. So once we have that, we can then go ahead and call the ingester to ingest our document. Again, this would not normally reside within our actual application that's running. This is something that would be somewhere separate, but this gives you an idea of like how do those vectors actually come to be. Once they are in there, this retriever knows how to actually take a piece of text and find the most relevant documents based on that. Let's build. Now that the retriever is defined here, should hopefully be a little bit better. So we'll see if this works. Hey, can you explain the cancellation policy to me? Okay, let's see. Okay, this seems a lot better. So now it's saying we can make that a little bit bigger maybe. So it's telling us what it is and then it's giving us an example and all of it. So, okay, now it actually knows about our stuff. So now it's a whole lot smarter. It's much more useful for what we're trying to achieve. Again, this is a good start and for a lot of applications, this is all you need. This is called retrieval augmented generation, RIG. So you might hear that. And for instance, for the Vaughn Docs Assistant that I built, this was all that was needed. I fed it all of our documentation, and then you can ask it questions, and it all of a sudden knows everything about Vaughn and uh, can put me out of a job, so I don't know why it craved that. <laughs> okay, so pretty good. Um, last thing we wanna do here is give the LLM some tools that it can use to actually pull up reservations, uh, in our case also cancel reservation, provided that it's in compliance with our policy. So for that, let's go ahead and create a new component. I'm gonna call this booking tools or booking tooled. That could also be a thing it could be called. All right, so booking tools is just a plain old spring component. Nothing crazy about that. It's gonna have a, or we're gonna inject my car rental service here. And we're gonna check that. So this is just the service that I'm using to interact with my backend. Uh, it's nothing kind of especially interesting for this talk in there. So what we wanna do though is we wanna define a tool. So we annotate any methods that we wanna make accessible as tools. And we're gonna have a public method that returns a booking details object called get booking details, we'll take in a string booking number. Yeah, I know, number, string, anyway. Uh, string first name, string last name, like that. Let's turn on Copilot here for a second, see if it can figure out what needs to happen here. Yeah, okay, and then we're gonna do another one. Tool for canceling, so it's gonna be a Public void cancel. Yes, good job AI. Okay, so we have two tools. We could here in the annotation uh, explain in more detail 
in text English explain what this is all about. And we could explain for each parameter what it's all about and what it should be and what it shouldn't be. Since we're using very descriptive names, we don't have to do that. It's going to be able to figure that out all by itself. So what we can do is we can go into our uh, agent configuration here. We're going to inject our booking tools like this. We're going to tell it that, hey, here are some tools you can use. Use those whenever appropriate. And these are going to get mapped to chat GBT functions. Again, let's build this. And then <laughs> now we need many crossed fingers to see if this actually works. OK, so there are two cases here. The first one, John Doe should not be able to cancel their booking because they are within that seven day window. And the last person should be able to. So let's try it out. Hey, my name is John Doe. My booking number is 101. Can you pull up my details? So let's see. Now it probably, hopefully, does things. OK, hello, John Doe. Here are details. Booking number. OK, so it has the details of when it's from. So it was able to actually go to our database and pull it up. OK. Can I cancel my booking? No. All right. So it knows that that's not permitted. Fun fact, if you use the GPT 3.5 model, it'll be like, okay, sure, let's do that. <laughs> so uh, lesson learned, like don't trust it. Like have very, like you need to have business validation for anything you're allowed to do, but it's still worth it. So let's see another one. So now let's be Robert Taylor and let's see if that actually works. Hey, my name is Robert Taylor. My booking number is 105. Can you please cancel my booking? All right, let's see. The Wi-Fi is not super fast, but it's working pretty well. All right, so I found the booking. Starts on 2nd November. Yeah, it looks right. You are allowed to cancel the booking. Okay, yeah, okay, so it's a little bit verbose. We could probably work on that system prompt. <laughs> uh, let me proceed. Yes, please. Okay, so happy to come. Canceled. Sorry to see you go. Ah, stop it. Okay, so now we can see in our live database view that it was actually canceled in our backend. Boom. All right, so we took a general purpose LLM. We made it more specific. Now it's doing our work, and we can do something more meaningful. Excellent. All right, let's uh, I have to jump over about 80 slides because I have a, a slideshow version of this as well. But we're going to go here. So if you're interested in taking this application and playing around with it, all you need to provide is an environment variable called OpenAI API key. And then you can just go ahead and start that as a Maven project. So. Feel free to poke around, uh, create issues, ask questions, uh, whatever. It's, again, not meant as a like production-ready thing, but more to just tickle your brain to get you thinking about, like, hmm, what could I do in my particular application that could kind of make my end users' lives easier? We have five more minutes, so I think we have some time for questions and hallucinations. So, yes, sir? Okay, so what happens if we don't provide our name? You, you saw the hallucination in my questions and hallucinations. <laughs> yeah, all, all the images are created with Dolly here, so you can probably <laughs> see why they're why they are with what they are. Okay, so yeah, let's see here. So we could actually try to be an actual user that doesn't follow any instructions ever, because that's how users work. Hey, please cancel my reservation. My name is John Doe. Of course, I don't give the booking number. Why would I do that? It's just like, OK, so can't tell. It's 101. But, but I was 
wondering if it's a, a like tool smart enough to see if I want to cancel a booking that's not my own. So what, what would happen there? No, no, I mean, we're not, not for this. So this would be the same as you would be, I don't know, calling to a phone thing and claiming to be yourself, so. I, again, not a production ready system. Please do not put this in. I cannot stress this enough. <laughs> I know some of you will, but please don't. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, another question over here. So have I tried to just keep insisting over and over? I have not. Uh, likely you would be able to maybe convince it. So again, you want to have like, again, if you give tools to the AI, you probably want to make sure that you have very strict validation <laughs> logic uh, uh, on it. But yeah, so when you're working with LLMs, they're stochastic systems. They're not deterministic. Things can happen. You can be persuasive. You can do what Mark showed you and like give it instructions to try to jailbreak it and all kinds of stuff. So the, it should be a tool that tries to help you, but it's very okay for you to have like strict validations and just tell the user to stop doing what they're trying to do. All right, so we have time for one more question. I think you're slightly quicker and we can take it in the hallway afterwards so Steven can come and wrap things up for us. So please. Okay, so the question was, does the data go to ChatGPT? And yes, in this case it does, because we're adding that to the prompt, to the context, essentially. So the booking details will go there. Now, where we created a streaming chat language model using OpenAI, that could be a, I don't know, a local llama model or some <laughs> other model uh, instead, if you wanted to have it locally. But yeah, so if anything you provide in the context will go there, they claim that they don't use any API calls for training. That may or may not be true, but depending on your <laughs> like uh, sensitivity to privacy stuff, you probably may or may not want to do that. So you could probably start with something that's less uh, security critical, like we did with the Docs Assistant. And then as kind of things progress here, like uh, it hasn't even been a full year since ChatGPT came out. So like in a year, I'm pretty sure like we'll be very much further along than we are right now. I need to wrap up now so Steven can come and uh, finish uh, this for us today. I'm gonna be out here, so if you have any more questions around this or anything else, let's wait for Steve to finish his thing and then we're gonna be out there for as long as needed answering questions, so thank you very much. Good to see you here, <laughs> goodbye.